In 1924, those prayers were answered with the Evangelical Theological College, later to be called Dallas Theological Seminary. Unfortunately, W.H. Griffith Thomas died that same year, but the lectureship that we began yesterday is a memorial to his commitment to the ideals of Dallas Theological Seminary. Each year, qualified lectures are selected alter alternately by each of the divisions of the seminary, biblical studies, theological studies, and ministries and communication. The lectures consist of the presentation of scholarly papers on topics that are not normally covered in the seminary curriculum or at the same depth. This year, our speaker was selected by the Department of Theological Studies. The annual lectures are generally published in BibSAC, the seminary's quarterly theological journal. Over the years, many noted scholars have presented the Griffith Thomas lectures, men such as Henry Ironside, Frank Gabelon, Francis Schaeffer, J.I. Packer, F.F. Bruce, and Bruce Metzger. This year, as we have announced, the theological, dis the theological Studies Department has invited Dr. Mark Dever as our guest lecturer for this week of extended chapel services. His series of lectures is entitled Puritan Visions of the Church. Mark Dever serves as the senior pastor of Capitol Hills Baptist Church in Washington, D.C. A Duke graduate, Dr. Dever holds an MDiv from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, a THM from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, and a Ph.D. in Ecclesiastical History from Cambridge University. He is the president of Nine Marks Ministries and has taught a number at a number of seminaries. Dr. Dever has authored several books and articles, most recently, The Church, The Gospel Made Visible. He and his wife Connie live and minister on Capitol Hill, with Connie giving a lot of her time to creating a children's curriculum praise factory, and they have two adult children. Will you please join me today in welcoming Dr. Mark Dever. Well, thank you again for the, to the faculty who asked me and the gracious invitation and the reception they've given me here these last couple of days as guest lecturer. These lectures examine some of the matters which were of central concern to Reformational Christians in the centuries following the Reformation. The Reformers had held the idea that there were two essential marks of the church, which are preaching and sacraments. The right, the right preaching of the Word of God and the right administration of baptism and the Lord's Supper. On this, there was unity between them and the generations that were to follow, and yet inside this unity, there was great diversity, which we want to flesh out this week. Yesterday, we considered Richard Sibbs and his vision of the evangelical church. Today, we want to look at John Bunyan and his view of the spiritual church. In one of the number of his works first published four years after his death, toward the conclusion of his application of Psalm 130, verse 7, Bunyan used an arresting image of a heart as an unreliable container for truth. Bunyan observed, quote, He that will keep water in a sieve must use more than ordinary diligence. Well, what Bunyan said of water in a sieve about truth in the heart is also true of keeping such biblically conscientious Christians as Bunyan and his fellow nonconformists together in churches. Nonconformists are any of those Protestant Christians in England who did not conform to the established church, the Church of England. It'll be this strange tension between Bunyan's dogged devotion to Scripture, which led to his own nonconformity, and yet his denial of what were to become important denominational boundaries. That tension that we want to consider in our time together. Was Bunyan a nonconformist? Was he a separatist? Was he a dissenter? Or was he, to use that old Texas phrase, a uniter, not a divider? <laughs> Bunyan's understanding of baptism really marks his understanding of the church. He had a rather uncommon notion of baptism. Now, I would love to talk about Bunyan's life. It's very interesting, uh, but we simply don't have time to do that. Uh, as yesterday we saw Sibbs' understanding of preaching being central, Bunyan would agree with that, and yet we get to the point today, the question really of the other mark of the church. 
baptism and the way one person understood it and the significance that may have for us today. That's what we want to note as we come to John Bunyan. Well, as I say, he had a rather uncommon notion of the relation of baptism and the Lord's Supper. The Orthodox and the Roman positions were clearly echoed in everything from antiquity to architecture, from the writings of the church fathers to the placements of the lavers of regeneration near the door of the church. It was clear that baptism was viewed as the initial vehicle of God's saving grace in a person's life, without which they would not be saved. Now, Martin Luther's understanding of justification fundamentally altered this teaching, at least among his followers, removing baptism from its central place and replacing that with faith alone in Christ alone. Baptism was still, however, understood to be the entering sacrament for those coming into the church. So Zwingli and Calvin had forged new understandings of the covenantal and promissory nature of baptism. But again, this left its practical position unchanged. Cranmer seems to have taken on board much of Calvin and Bootser's position in his understanding of baptism. It was left really to the continental Anabaptists and the English Baptists somewhat later to completely re-understand baptism as a parallel not of physical circumcision, but of spiritual circumcision. That is, as something which was to accompany not physical birth, but spiritual birth. It was this teaching that John Bunyan, faithful member of the Church of England, came to during the tumultuous 1650s. So this is 15 years after Richard Sibbs died. John Bunyan came under the influence of John Gifford, pastor of St. John's Church in Bedford. Gifford seems to have been a kind of early Baptist, but in coming to his re-understanding of baptism, he went further than most others who were coming to such Positions. Most of the Baptists, as was reflected in the second edition of the First London Confession, put out in 1646, most of the Baptists understood baptism as the entering ordinance into the church, as Christians had unquestionably for centuries. Article 39 of the First London Confession reads, Baptism is an ordinance of the New Testament given by Christ to be dispensed upon persons professing faith or that are made disciples who upon profession of faith ought to be baptized and after to partake of the Lord's Supper. Close quote. So Baptists, like all other professing Christians historically, like all other professing Christians historically, uh, understood baptism to be a prerequisite to the privileges of membership in the church, notably communion, and yet the Baptists, like other Protestants, did not understand baptism to be saving in the sense of ex opere operato, the work itself working, in and of itself effective, apart from our personal faith. They did not understand that, as Protestants did not understand that in general. The doctrinal change these Baptists advocated was a change in the direction of the church, making it more pure, more visible, more approximate to the invisible church. As such, their understanding was often attacked as a kind of donatism or hyper-Puritanism. Uh, this was the way that Richard Sibbs, for example, who was known as the best at any in London and bringing them about, who has started to wander over into nonconformity, in these kind of positions. Uh, this is the way they would attack it. They would take those who were tempted with believing this kind of stuff and get them to read Augustine's anti-donatist writings so that they wouldn't try to over-purify the church. Now, such an understanding of baptism as being for believers only was certainly the death knell of an established church, as the church was no longer understood to be coextensive with society. I don't know if you've ever thought of that before, but that's how you get the connection between Baptist and religious liberty. Uh, I understand that in the 1970s and 80s, the secular media from where I live loved to paint fundamentalist Baptists like Jerry Falwell as threatening a theonomy in America. And through ignorance, there may be things like that that go on or through rampant post-millennialism. But there is nothing like that that can actually happen with a Baptist ecclesiology. Because of all people, Baptists are the ones who know you have to opt in yourself to the church. You know, our, our Presbyterian and Lutheran and Methodist and Anglican and Roman Catholic and Greek Orthodox friends all think that all your children can be brought into the church in some significant fashion merely upon their being born into your family. <laughs> 
Well, as long as that's the case, you can have an established church, at least an established church. But the moment you blow up that connection between being born into your family and automatic baptism, you immediately logically lose the ability to have an established church, at least in any sense that it had been established heretofore in history. So there was no longer, with this understanding of baptism, possibility, unless it was an unusual move of the Holy Spirit and absolutely everybody in the town professes conversion immediately, uh, there was just no way for the church to be coextensive with society. Much more could be said about that. But this understanding of uh, Baptists on baptism was not the final subjectivizing of baptism as its opponents often made it out to be. At least no more so than the Reformed subjectivizing happened about reception of the Lord's Supper, saying only believers should come to the Lord's Supper. It's exactly the same thing. If you want to get to subjectivizing in this period, the ultimate in subjectivizing the Christian faith, making it all centered on the internal, was undoubtedly the Quakers. Uh, the Quakers renounced all such outward formalities and drove home a version of the Christian gospel which majored in ethics and integrity with what one knows for oneself to be true. Well, Bunyan knew about the Quakers well. He had entered into pamphlet warfare with them. Uh, he had attacked them bitterly, as was the custom of the day. But in 1673, he took up his pen against another group, much closer to his own thoughts. The Baptists. Bunyan began to fight with the Baptists, which people today often don't realize. This may surprise some of you, because Bunyan is often thought of as a Baptist. And he did reject infant baptism. That's true. But he also rejected the position that many of the emerging Baptists of his own day expressed, and that is this, that there can be no church communion and therefore no church membership for those who have not been baptized as believers. He rejected that emerging opinion of the Baptists. He was therefore what Richard Greaves has called an open membership Baptist. So Bunyan was himself convinced that infant baptism was a nullity. It had no spiritual reality significance to it whatsoever. And therefore, he himself had himself baptized as a believer, but he was not prepared to limit church membership only to those who agreed with him on such, to use his word, externals. Bunyan had a more spiritual vision of the church. In one of his works, Bunyan poses the question, and I believe this in his own words, quote, notwithstanding all that you have said, water baptism ought to go before church membership. Show me one in all the New Testament that was received into fellowship without it. This is the question he's putting, and Bunyan began his answer, that water baptism hath formerly gone first is granted, but that it ought of necessity so to do, I never saw proof. Okay, this kind of Simple reasoning typified Bunyan's approach to the topic. His opponent's arguments would be frankly and simply stated and would be as frankly and simply refuted. In various ways, Bunyan kept asserting the inconsistency of accepting someone as a Christian, but not as a member of your church. He wrote, quote, I am therefore for holding communion thus because... The edification of souls in the faith and holiness of the gospel is of greater concern than an agreement in outward things. I say it is of greater concernment with us and of far more profit to our brother than our agreeing in or contesting for the business of water baptism. And again, I am for holding communion thus because love, which above all things we're commanded to put on, is of much more worth than to break about baptism. But to conclude this, when we attempt to, to force our brother beyond his light or to break his heart with grief, to thrust him beyond his faith or to, to bar him from his privilege, how can we say I love? What shall I say? Strange. Take two Christians equal in all points with this. Nay, let one go beyond the other for grace and holiness. Yet this circumstance of water shall drown and sweep away all his excellencies, not counting him worthy of that reception that with hand and heart shall be given to a novice in religion, because he consents to water. Bunyan always writes like that. <laughs> one of John Bunyan's first pieces to write and publish after he got out of jail was his 1673, Differences in Water Baptism, No Bar to Communion. 
So if you want to note down one thing that you would read to understand Bunyan on this topic that I'll mention in this lecture, that is the piece. He wrote other things, but this is the one you want to look at. 1673, differences to, in water baptism, no bar to communion. This was a brief book of slightly more than 30,000 words. In it, he answered a book by Thomas Paul and William Kiffin, which had asserted what we've come to know today as the sort of standard Baptist position. Bunyan wrote, to clarify further his contention, quote, that the church of Christ hath not warrant to keep out of their communion the Christian that is discovered to be a visible saint by the word, the Christian that walketh according to his light with God. In this work, Bunyan repeats the same arguments that he had made before, that is, that, that baptism pertains to the individual's obedience and not to the church qua church, not, not to the church as church. Following along, he was really just answering what Paul and Kiffin had responded to in, uh, in Bunyan's own arguments. So this time, the arguments were really muddied by his concern to answer what he felt were the misrepresentations and false uh, conclusions of his opponents. It maybe is in a clear example of more heat not producing more light. But in, in the second half of the work, Bunyan addressed arguments and questions put by Paul and Kiffin. And I have to say that reading that second half of Bunyan's Differences in Water Baptism was for me a bit like reading, because I'm a Baptist minister, so it's a bit like reading Harry Emerson Fosdick's thoroughly wrong-headed and very stirring sermon, Shall the Fundamentalist Win? I mean, if you've never read it, I encourage you to read it. We, we regularly have uh, folks read it. I, I'll have a young Christian read it and try to answer it. Because the rhetoric is excellent, and the, part, the, the rhetoric, I think, is, says false things. So I think it's a very powerful bit of rhetoric, but nevertheless, it's, it's finally unconvincing. But, but if you're a Baptist minister and you want to see if you're really convinced, you might want to take up that second half of Bunyan's differences about water baptism, no bar to communion, and see if you can answer each one of Bunyan's replies to Paul and Kiffin. Well, or alternatively, if you're not a Baptist here, uh, and you would like to convert or merely sharpen one of your Baptist brethren on this point, this is your arsenal for theological jousting. Uh, I'll even help you find it. Uh, in the works of John Bunyan, the George Offer edition, three volumes, 19th century, tiny print, double column, but it gets, gets it all in there in three volumes. Very worth your perusing and getting to know. You can get it for free probably on Kindle these days, or you can get hardbound volumes for about 70 bucks at uh, CBD or Amazon or probably maybe your bookstore here, but uh, in that three volume, that standard edition of Bunyan's works, it's in the middle volume, the second volume. It's on pages 635 to 640. So it's only about six pages, but it's six pages of tiny print double column. It's a lot of stuff. But uh, volume two, pages 635 to 640. Anyway, upon his death, Bunyan still had uh, 12 works largely prepared for the press, but unpublished. Uh, at least part of the reason this must have been the hostility of the government to works from people such as Bunyan who were openly critical of the religious establishment. In April of 1688, an indulgence was issued which greatly relaxed requirements for works printed, and he had four months between then and his death in August of 1688, and during those four months, he got five books printed. He was ready. Um, one of those books which came out in his posthumous collected works was a fairly small piece uh, it was called Peaceable Principles and True. Peaceable Principles and True. And it answered another author, another Baptist author's Danvers and Paul's answers to his differences in judgment about water baptism, no, no bar to communion. So the, the pamphlet wars go on and on and on. It's like an email chain. I mean, you, you, you may not find the bottom of it, but it, you, you can keep following them. They're there. Bunyan again restates his positions, though with somewhat more brevity. He says... I have denied that baptism was ever ordained of God to be a wall of division between the holy and the holy. The holy that are and the holy that are not so baptized with water as we are. This book was, as much as the other, marked by plain speech. For example, he writes, quote, Your first five pages are spent to prove me either proud or a liar. You ask me next, how long is it since I was a Baptist? Since you would know by what name I would be distinguished from others, I tell you, I would be and I hope I am a Christian. And choose if God should count me worthy to be called a Christian, a believer, or other such name, which is approved by the Holy Ghost. 
As for those factious titles of Anabaptists, Independents, Presbyterians, or the like, I conclude that they came neither from Jerusalem nor Antioch, but rather from hell and Babylon. <laughs> for they naturally tend to divisions. You may know them by their fruits. If you've never read Bunyan, you are in seminary. You might enjoy him. Bunyan concludes with a prayer. God banish bitterness out of the churches and pardon them that are the maintainers of schisms and divisions among the godly. Well, as I say, Bunyan was himself, of course, no such divider. He was an English heir of the Protestant Reformation, and he sought for that Reformation to continue. Ecclesia reformata, semper reformandum, secundum verbum dei, reformed church always being reformed according to the word of God. The church so reformed, Bunyan was attempting to do this, in part by attempting to compose brethren who were alienated from each other on less than essential matters, together for the gospel. In the closing remarks to his 1673 treatise, Differences About Water Baptism and Nebartic Communion, Bunyan sums up what might be called his baptism project well. Quote, I strive not for mastery, nor to show myself singular, meaning unique, the only one who ever thought something. But if it might be for union and communion among the godly. Close quote. So that's Bunyan. What does this all mean for us? D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, in his last address at the Westminster Conference, given in 1978, was on this very topic. And he pled for exactly Bunyan's position. In reflecting on this, let me begin by saying that I am powerfully attracted to Bunyan's position. I'm an agnostic who became a Christian. I like talking to people about the gospel. Um, as a Baptist pastor, few things pain me more than turning away visible saints who are pedo baptists and desire membership in our church. You know, how many times have I sat there in a membership interview with a lovely PCA couple who love our church, and they're so Presbyterian, they're even willing to obey the elders and submit to baptism. But of course, we don't understand it that way as congregationalists. We understand they actually need to believe this stuff in order to do it. In order for it to be baptism, they actually need to think this is baptism. They need to think they're obeying Christ. So we can't let them do it. We turn them away. They need to join a church where they would agree with the teaching of the Word of God on that point. I would love to follow Bunyan's lead and treat this as just a kind of weaker brother situation. Richard Graves has summarized Bunyan's position vis-a-vis -vis the other Baptists by saying that, quote, in the end, the whole argument could be reduced to a question of whether or not love would triumph over ecclesiasticism. And Bunyan harbored no doubts about his preference for the former alternative. Close quote. But there seem to be a few matters which are not theologically essential to being a Christian, yet which are essential to have agreement upon in order for the church to function. And since the Reformation, for the overwhelming majority of Protestants, some questions of agenda, what we will do, can become practically as important as questions of credenda, what we believe. Questions of what is to be done are not only more quickly obvious to the layperson than questions of what is to be believed, they're also often viewed as more important. So this preacher may or may not believe that there are errors tucked away in the Bible somewhere, but I can sure tell you if this preacher is a man or a woman. This preacher may or may not believe in the exhaustive foreknowledge of God of all future events, but I can easily tell you if this preacher baptizes infants. This preacher may or may not believe in the death of Christ as a penal substitute for my sinful self, but if I keep attending, I'll be able to tell if the bishop or the congregation or the denomination's general assembly or the preacher has the last say in the church. Now, any of these issues of polity and practice we may declare to be matters indifferent. We may allow freedom in our congregations on these matters. We may be united despite our differences, and on and on I could go in sort of positively presenting uh, charitable attempts to unite a church. But it, friends, at the end of the day, we must do something and we will do the one and not the other. 
We will recognize women as elders and bishops. We will recognize national assemblies or congregations as our final earthly authority, infants as viable subjects of baptism, or we will not. Finally, you could say Bunyan took a nearly Quaker position on baptism, that it is not essential for communion, for church membership. So it would be left to be a matter of individual judgment. Sure, at Bunyan's Meeting House in Bedford, you may have a pastor one day teach infant baptism, and the next pastor may not, but neither one's teaching would fundamentally affect the church. Does that really create the unity of the Spirit? Does it create an understanding that baptism is in the eye of the beholder? Does it make obedience altogether too subjective a matter? Is disobedience to a command of Christ a mere lack of light to be born with, as Bunyan maintained? Or is it a disciplinable offense, a sin? Let me ask you a question for those of you who are parents here in the room. Do we teach our children to mean well? Or to act well, to do well? Do we teach them that they must not hit their brother? Or that there must not be any malice when they do? <laughs> Did you know that the Bible teaches that there are such things as unintentional sins? Leviticus 4 and 5, Numbers 15, Ezekiel 45, elsewhere, all about such sins. But, it, but it's, what in the, it's what's in the heart that counts. Is that what we want people to hear from God's word? Don't misunderstand me. The, the intentions of the heart are hugely important. So Moses taught that intentional sins should receive worse punishments. The Lord Jesus taught that intentions themselves were sins. And in some ways they were the very heart of sin. But he never taught that that was all there is to sin. Because we all know from the Bible that one of the effects of sin is to stupefy us to dull us and to darken us, and that does not make us irresponsible for our sins. So those dwelling in sin are said to dwell in darkness, but that in no way finally ameliorates their guilt. Jesus in Matthew 25 presents the judgment of God in the passage about the sheep and the goats, and after inviting the one into eternal blessedness, the Almighty then turns to the goats, and he says to them, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. Do you remember what the goats pled? Do you remember what their defense attorney did? They pled specifically their motives, their intentions as an excuse. Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? And did that exculpate them? He will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Friends, the best of motives, notwithstanding, obedience to God is not in the eye of the beholder, unless the beholder is God himself. And how do we know what he considers obedience or not? By his own self-revelation. We have no other sure and certain guide. Not even the church. No, my Roman Catholic friend. In the New Testament, we see the churches erring again and again. Revelation 2 and 3 in most all the churches that the epistles are addressed to. I'm amazed sometimes when, when I see, again, this younger generation taking such faith in the patristics. Like the second and third century were these towers of light and revelation. As if these churches, because they're, they're just one or two hundred years away from Jesus, are so much more sure a guide than you know, St. Luke's United Methodist Church down the road is, or Bob's Baptist Church is. You know, I mean, Really? Have you not looked even a hundred years closer to Christ in the New Testament letters? Those churches were a mess, even when the apostles were there. It's the instructions the Holy Spirit inspired to be written to them that guide us, not the antiquity of the churches themselves. Error is as old as can be. We know from Acts and Galatians that even Peter erred. So then, do we know what God considers obedience by our own conscience, by our own inner light? 
No, my modern individualistic, subjectivistic friend, no. In the New Testament, we see Paul writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 4, 4, my conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. My conscience being clear does not make me innocent. The acquittal we need is not finally from our church or from ourselves. It is from God. The psalmist realized this when he prayed in Psalm 51, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Sin is an objective reality based upon our thoughts and deeds or our lack of them over against how God would have us to live as his creatures uniquely made in his image. It is not finally determined by us or by our intentions, but by God as judge of our thoughts and lives, and he is indescribably holy and good and righteous and perfect. And he has revealed himself to us in his word. Now, John Bunyan believed and taught all of that that I just said. I do not want to misrepresent my brother on this at all. His heart for the unity of the church, I think, well reflects the heart of our Lord in John 17. When he prayed, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Amen. But if you ask the question how they were to be so united, well, look in John 17, verse 17, where he prays that God would sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. My conclusion, for what it's worth, is that John Bunyan, without intending to, I'm sure, edited Jesus. If he understood Jesus to clearly command baptism of believers, he has no right then to call anything else that. In that sense, in my mind, he stands as a, an attractive siren to the kind of essentialism and individualism and subjectivism that is killing modern American evangelicalism. But Bunyan's vision of the spiritual church is also a Puritan vision of the church. I wouldn't be faithful if I didn't represent it to you. There's much that's good in it. So much more can be said about this. We'd love just to go into a large Q&A time, but that's not how these lectures are set up. Lord willing, we'll consider another tomorrow, and that is Jonathan Edwards' vision of a believer's church, where we've had preaching and baptism, and now we'll come to the most controversial of all, the Lord's Supper. Thank you.